In 1950, less than 5% of all major seafood species were in a state of collapse. And a state of collapse means that you're currently at 10% or less of what would be considered a healthy yield of that species in the ocean. Now by 2050, it's expected that nearly 100% of all major seafood species will be in a state of collapse. Now you couple that with the fact that our freshwater resources are already in decline and that the world's human population is expected to increase from its current 7.5 billion to 9.5 or 10 billion. So what does 2050 look like? With virtually no seafood left, less fresh water, and two billion more people on the planet. I have no idea, but I'll leave that up for you <laughs> to imagine in your own mind. Regardless though, if we want to leave this world a better place for the people that we care about the most, we have got to change the way that we think. I'm here today to introduce you to a really cool new way of growing food called aquaponics and to frame a strategy for changing the way that we think on a mass scale. And it starts right here in our city. So if you lived in the 1980s or below, you had never heard of a species of fish called tilapia. And you've probably never seen one with his head on before. <laughs> Now, right now, tilapia is one of the most popularly consumed seafood uh, products on the planet. So why in 40 years did it go from total obscurity to everybody knowing what it is? Well, as the ocean's stocks were declining worldwide, but the demand for seafood products was on the rise, we had to start farming fish, which is a good thing, because if we want to let the ocean species rebound, we better start growing fish ourselves. Now, there's been some inherent issues with tilapia farming, especially from an environmental standpoint. And if you can imagine, let's say you put a million fish into a pond and you're feeding them to get them up to market size quick and they're producing waste in the water. Those wastes start to accumulate and, become, and that makes the water become toxic for the fish. So what you would do is you would discharge a bunch of that dirty water and you would bring in precious fresh water to, re, uh, to top up the pond and to make it safe for the fish again. So you're farming fish, which is a good thing, but you're still wasting fresh water. So in the late 1980s, the University of Virgin Islands started developing a technology that we now know as aquaponics. And with aquaponics, you raise tilapia or other freshwater fish in tanks, and instead of discharging that dirty water, you use it to grow plants hydroponically or without soil. And you can see here, that these plants are floating on styrofoam sheets and there's little holes cut in the styrofoam and the roots grow down into that water filled with nutrients created by the fish and they pull the nutrients out of the water, converting them into stems and leaves and fruits and vegetables, therefore cleaning the water to be returned back to the fish. And this allows for 100% recirculation of water. So now you're farming fish, taking pressure off the oceans, you're recycling the water over and over again and you're growing a ton of fresh produce. But even more important, maybe, is that this is a beautiful representation of how an ecosystem works. And it has the potential to help us mitigate some of these challenges we face around 2050, but it also has the potential to change the way that we think. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of a crazy story. Back in 2011, I was managing a hydroponics retail store, mostly selling cannabis growing equipment. <laughs> Weed. And I was in my early 20s. So you can imagine my life is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> and one day, a guy walks into my store. And people used to come up with all these crazy excuses to not like let it be known they're trying to grow weeds. So they'd say, hey, I'm trying to grow the most sticky, potent tomatoes. Can you help me? <laughs> So this guy comes into my store and he says, I just got back from Haiti and they just had an earthquake that killed 200,000 people in a couple days. So I knew he wasn't BSing this time. And he asked me if I could help him because he was taken down there as an urban planner to rebuild a new village. And he couldn't get his mind past the fact of how are these people going to feed themselves when the aid runs out? 
So he saw that you could grow plants without soil using hydroponics because the soil in uh, Haiti is totally exhausted from deforestation. So he Googled hydroponics and he's at my store. This guy's name was Ron Morgan. And Ron was a famous architect here in Charlotte. And he actually ran the bond referendum to get Discovery Place and Spirit Square put here. He converted old warehouses into city halls, designed greenway systems, and helped save First Ward Elementary back in the 80s. So he was a man of great civic action. And here he is in my store asking me for help to feed people in Haiti with hydroponics. And he had built this disfunct hydroponic garden in his yard as a sort of a prototype of what he could eventually send down there. But it wasn't working. So he asked me to come over to his house and check it out. And I told him about aquaponics, because I had just been learning about it. And he flipped out. He was like, yeah, that's really cool. So how about we teach people in Haiti how to grow fish and vegetables together while recycling the water? So me and Ron and a couple of our friends built an aquaponics system in his yard, as an example. And we tricked this thing out. We had a really cool koi pond in the ground that we crafted out of cement. We had plants floating in plastic pipes, floating in water. And lo and behold, kids from all around the neighborhood would come up to the garden. And they were fascinated with it. And mind you, we were doing this as a humanitarian effort. But we had kids wanting to get engaged with this. They wanted to feed the fish. They wanted to harvest the crops. So we started teaching them how to operate it. And in order to operate one, you have to know basic science. So we started teaching them how to check the pH of the water, nitrogen levels, how to record the yields. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, their parents started to make remarks to us. Why is my kid talking about science at dinner? He's 10 years old. This is weird. <laughs> and this started happening over and over again. And we started to realize aquaponics was not just a cool way to grow food that was good for the environment but was a profound teaching tool for science and math. And it was getting kids engaged in healthy eating. Because when they're invested in growing their own food, they're automatically willing to try it. So through a series of other crazy events, we end up getting a contract with the North Carolina Department of Public Safety to set up an aquaponics program in a juvenile detention center. And for the last four years, I've been teaching incarcerated young men from 14 to 18 how to grow food using aquaponics and all the other skills that you learn along the way. That program became pretty successful and before we knew it, we were installing aquaponics programs in high schools all around the region. We finally went down to Haiti, installed two there, and this thing really started to have a life of its own. So, <clears throat> to give you an example of some of the really valuable lessons learned through aquaponics in schools, Imagine you have an aquaponics system at, let's say, an elementary school. And you bring in these little baby fish at the beginning of the year, and the students are individually weighing and measuring each one before they put them in the tank. They're feeding them throughout the school year, harvesting all the vegetables that are growing, learning all these cool scientific principles. And one day, the vegetable plants have holes in the leaves, and you find out they have an insect uh, infestation. And so, what do you do when you have insects on plants? You spray them with pesticides. So the students spray down these vegetables with pesticides. Then the next day, they come in, and all the fish that they've been growing all year are belly up dead in the water. And the students are, you know, they're devastated. What happened? Well, it comes to find out. The pesticides ran off into the water and killed the fish, just like it happens in real life. They were learning to change the way they think. Because the world we live in is not linear. It's totally dynamic. You make one change, and it affects a whole group of different things. That experience changes the way a young person views their actions toward the environment. It creates a more compassionate person toward planet Earth. Another example, one of our students at the detention center was in our program for two years. And an administrator was interviewing him one day. And they asked, what are you going to do when you're released from here? He says, I'm going to open up a motorcycle shop. And they're like, a motorcycle shop? What does that have to do with aquaponics? You've learned all these great skills. He says, well, before I came in this program, 
I didn't really know I could do anything. But now I can repair water pumps. I can do plumbing. I know how to grow food. I can manage an ecosystem. And I think motorcycles are really cool. And now I think I can open a motorcycle shop. <laughs> so it was about embracing opportunities around hands-on learning that build confidence within students. So after we had all these high schools on board, and we had the two gardens in Haiti, the genius of Ron Morgan says, why don't we start connecting all these gardens together? So we could have a garden here in our city, connect to an aquaponic garden in Haiti, and they could be exchanging all the critical information around the garden, pH levels, nitrogen levels, yield information. They could monitor each other's garden. But more importantly, they could talk to each other and open up conversations around science, food, culture, why you live there, why I live here, what it means to live in a place like Haiti. And through these connections, you develop people that have a much better understanding of others through connecting them through education. One example, one of our schools we connected to Haiti up in Statesville. The French classes in that school in Statesville got wind that they were connected to a garden in Haiti. So they teamed up, unbeknownst to us, with the agriculture classes at the school and the media classes, and they developed aquaponics how-to videos translated into French to send down to Haiti to teach kids about aquaponics. Now talk about a French class <laughs> with some purpose. <laughs> it was changing the way that they think about going to school. And what we learned with these aquaponics gardens, you can create smarter people through hands-on learning. You can create more compassionate people in regards to the environment and others. And you can create healthier people because they're engaged in eating all the products coming out. You change the way that they think. Now, I mentioned I was going to frame a strategy for changing the way that we think on a mass scale. Let's say you put an aquaponics garden in a school. And you have 200 students in that school changing the way they think. Let's say a city were to upfit 100 schools with aquaponics gardens. Let's say it's Charlotte. I'm from here, so let's say it's Charlotte. If you had 200 students per school, per year, and you had 100 of them, that'd be 20,000 students per year changing the way they think. And in short order, over 10 years, that would be 200,000 students who are smarter, who are more compassionate toward the environment and each other, who eat healthier, who are all around better people. You know what 200,000 represents in this city? It's one quarter of our current population. It effectively is an entire generation of people who change the way that they think. Now, what implications does that have on our city? Well, I had to imagine what 2050 looks like with virtually no seafood, less fresh water, more people. Well, what if in 2050, we had plenty of seafood left and all those endangered species are rebounding and we have plenty of fresh water and we've avoided all of the civic unrest that could have been due to too few resources to go around for all the people. What if those people living in a better world, the people we care about the most, didn't just view Charlotte as a place with sports teams and international airport, craft breweries, but the city that three decades earlier decided that they were gonna change the way an entire generation of people think the city that showed the whole world how to do it. The city that in large part helped to save the human species and the planet as we know it. Now talk about something to be known for, for a city. And if we do big, bold moves, like building 100 gardens, that legacy and that identity is ours to have. A year and a half ago, my friend Ron Morgan died of cancer. And in his last days, he sat me down. He said, Sam, 
I want to thank you for being a part of the most important project of my life. Changing the way people think about learning, about food, about each other, was Ron's most important project. And if we want 2050 to be a better world for the people we care about the most, changing the way we think might just be the most important project for all of humanity. Thank you.